On the Proper Treatment of Connectionism, again, 1988 by Paul Smolensky from the Department of Computer Science and Institute of Cognitive Science at University of Colorado, Boulder. So we'll go over, again, what is a connectionist model? It's a large network of simple parallel computing elements. Each element has an activation numeric activation value A computed using the activation of its connected neighbors in a network together using some simple numerical formula. The activations from neighbors travel along connections. The influence that a node has on another node is determined by the weight on the connection between them. So if a node has a positive activation, a positive weight means the influence is positive. If the weight is negative, then the influence is negative. In many connectionist models, inputs are given to the system by setting activation values of specific input nodes, which encodes the sensory input. Then the activations propagate along connections and take a path from the input to the output. And the output then affects a motor response. And so there is a computation being performed by the network from the input to the output. It's a transformation. And this transformation depends on the connection rates. And so usually these weights of the network are considered as storing the, the system's knowledge. And so the network acts like a computer program. It's doing a computation on the inputs and, and um, obviously the hidden nodes and producing some output. Unlike a traditional computer program, which is programmed by a computer, uh, the networks themselves program, they program themselves and they actually, they call this learning. And this is just some procedure by which the network weights are determined automatically. And usually right. they do this by giving the network an input output pair mm -hmm. so that it can show the network. This is what your output needs to look like from these given inputs. And so the goal of this paper is to articulate the goals of connectionism, the fundamental hypotheses it's testing, and its relations linking it to cognitive science. And it's kind of difficult to do because there's a lot, a lot of different frameworks under the connectionist umbrella. And at this time, those methods really had yet to be fully developed. Um, so the author offers his connectionist framework called the proper treatment of connectionism, or PTC which departs radically from the traditional cog connectionist approaches by putting connectionism in con contact with the theories of cognitive science, like the classical AI theories. So to the author, it appears that the supporters of the traditional approach to AI do not fully understand the challenge and opportunity posed by connectionism, dismissing them as mostly necessary because computers are already universal Turing machines. Whereas supporters of connectionisms do not are articulate properly or even at all how connectionism relates to trad traditional AI, neglecting aspects such as the rules, sequential processing, logic, and concepts without understanding their significance. And many of the issues of connectionism are due to the level of analysis adopted. This is, again, what the symbolic people argue. So most connectionists are going to tell you that connectionism is operating on the neural level, that, that um, you're basically simulating neurons. The author right. is going to argue right. different. Jake. Jake. The author. Uh, the author is going to argue that this version of connections operates on a higher level of abstraction and higher than the neural level. And it's better not to construe it with the neural level. And this level is not quite as high as the symbolic level. Um, as the traditional AI approaches do take, but it's a little bit lower. And this author calls this level the sub-symbolic level. And so the traditional approach is being called symbolic or conceptual to emphasize that the cognitive descriptions are symbols in a semantic sense and a syntactic sense. Um, on the other hand, by calling PTC a sub-symbolic or a sub-conceptual paradigm, it's emphasizing that the descriptions built are built of entities the descriptions are built of entities that correspond to constituents of symbols used in the symbolic paradigm called subsymbols. So um, subsymbols make up the symbols of the symbolic paradigm. <clears throat> and subsymbols only participate in numeric, not syntactic computation. Thus, a discrete operation occurring at the higher symbolic level is corresponding to a large number of fine-grained continuous operations on the subsymbolic level. So consider what is an appropriate formalization for knowledge. Most of the formal knowledge in human culture is stored in the form of language and linguistic structure. And this is really obvious in science. So you can learn, like in school, scientific knowledge in the form of a sentence. 
For example, you might hear a sentence like energy is conserved. It's neither created nor destroyed. And this is a very useful format for knowledge because it allows others to access that knowledge. It can be verified by others for its reliability because they can access it and understand it. And you can perform generic inferential operations like logic on this knowledge to derive other conclusions, even without the relevant domain experience. So now that you know energy is conserved, you can use that in other applications, even if you don't have a deep understanding of physics, you at least know this. And similarly, the laws and rules of countries and organizations are laid out in language. And so the goal at the cultural level of using language is to express knowledge in a form that can be understood uh, universally by different and inexperienced people. So we can view the top level conscious processor of a human as a virtual machine, which runs programs given to us consisting of cultural knowledge. And this conscious rule interpreter is a process and it's universal and it runs sequentially. And it goes perfectly with language-based knowledge because language is explicit. It contains step-by-step -step definitions and instructions. And so consciousness can be modeled as the sequential execution and or interpretation of rules. And the rules are formulated using the items at the conceptual level. So now that we've considered cultural and linguistic knowledge, now let's consider a different kind of knowledge. Consider the knowledge in an athlete, uh, a skilled athlete. This knowledge cannot be explicitly expressed. So uh, an athlete can't transfer their understanding of sports necessarily using language. Um, they can only really do that in symbolic sequential terms to explain the very high level procedure. But instead, the low level procedure is contained inside the person. And so it's known and executed intuitively without ever explicitly thinking about it and not consciously. So the author expands the mind now to contain not only the top level virtual machine processor, but also a second processor called the intuitive processor. So if you have a conscious processor running linguistic and symbolic programs on the top level, then there's an intuitive processor running programs at the sub symbolic level. And this is a well-documented phenomenon that indeed we do have two, basically kind of two processors, because if you consciously practice something many times, you take the conscious effort to sit down and practice a skill, eventually that skill will transfer from the conscious level to the subconscious automatic level. And you'll be able to do that skill without even thinking about it. And so in the traditional approach, it's assumed that the intuitive processor also runs on linguistic rules that are sequentially interpreted. They just do this subconsciously um, using some sort of unconscious rule interpretation. Correspondingly, it's assumed that the programs on the intuitive processor, the lower processor, are also symbols, just the same as the concepts on the higher processor. And so it's argued in, in the classic AI, it's basically argued that the sub-symbolic level operates in basically the same way as the symbolic level. But the author will reject this. And he points out that many, many leading connectionists used to work in traditional AI, and they've made very serious attempts to use symbols as intuitive on the intuitive level, but this has only resulted in failure. And this is because the symbolic systems were too brittle and inflexible. It's not clear, stop eating this. It's not clear how to represent implicit knowledge on the symbolic level. So it's not clear how to use symbols to represent like continuous values, things like this. And the symbolic systems bas basically had no link or insight to the natural brains, which is our only source of truth for cognition. And so that's basically why he um, is pro-connectionist. And so stop it. The failure of symbolic AI to account for the implicit knowledge, this was a, basically a major motivation for connectionist alternatives to emerge, um, which we discussed before. Um, basically hoping that these connectionist alternatives will help us to achieve goals in cognitive science that we couldn't achieve before. Um, and in the modern day, we can see that th this is the case. There's many things that we can do with the neural systems today that weren't possible in the past. Um, basically involving the processing of, processing of raw like sensory data or numeric data. Um, consider an alternative viewpoint that a connectionist could hold saying like the neural architecture hypothesis saying that the intuitive processor for a given task has to have the same architecture that the brain uses the problem with this is that we don't know that much about the brain 
And so the author is going to adopt a, a different hypothesis, again, not on the neural level, on a slightly higher level, called the connectionist dynamical system hypothesis. And this says that the state of the intuitive processor at any moment is precisely defined by a vector of numerical values, one value for each node. The dynamics of the intuitive processor are governed by a differential equation. The numerical parameters in this equation constitute the processor's program or knowledge. In learning systems, these parameters change according to the differential equation. So now the question becomes, what is a unit in, in one of these systems? It's not a symbol because we don't have a syntactic structure. So instead, they're called subsymbols. And the entities, the subsymbols, um, or sorry, the entities in the processor with the semantics of conscious concepts, so the symbols, are actually complex patterns of subsymbolic activity over many units. So every unit in the system participates um, in representing many such symbols on the higher level. So there are um, simple interactions between the nodes, but they themselves do not have conceptual semantics. Instead, each node contributes to a higher level conceptual semantics. On the other hand, and this is kind of important um, because basically what the author is kind of arguing here is for implementing the classical AI using um, kind of like using a connectionist network, but only approximately. And that's kind of the key difference here is that um, the people in the symbolic school think that this needs to be basically um, explicit. <clears throat> Whereas here he's saying that all these things all these things emerge from a subconceptual network. All these higher level concepts and symbols and rules, these all emerge from a network of subconceptual units. Um, but this emergence, it's not, uh, it's not guaranteed. It's not like a hard rule. It's only approximate. So you won't really be able to um, like very easily pull a symbol out of representing what a neural network is thinking about. You can only approximate. And so that's why they're incompatible. Um, this is a difficult issue because again, they can't actually implement each other. They can only approximate. The, the sub-symbolic is only approximating the symbolic paradigm. Um, <clears throat> and this is an important point because if it turns out that they actually really can truly implement each other, then it's kind of a futile discussion to even talk about the difference between these paradigms because one is literally equivalent to the other. One can be um, computed by the other. So it's the same thing. Um, so it might be a fusel argument after all. So that's not what he's going to argue. He's going to argue that instead the sub-symbolic uh, system only approximates symbolism. Um, on, on the other, so he says, if it turns out that they do only implement each other, if a connectionist network does only merely implement a symbolic program, it will be a genuine defeat for the connectionist school of cognitive science, since the symbolic method can be implemented by other, maybe simpler means. So instead, the author is going to claim that there is no formal account of cognition that exists at the conceptual level. There is only one that we can, for a precise definition, we can only give it at the subconceptual level. So it, it's still an open question to determine how the general principles of activity, uh, how activity corresponds to concepts. Um, so you can the way he gives some ways that we could possibly constrain representations to study this. So we could study features from certain domains. Um, so for example, uh, like convolutional neural networks would be a really good place um, to look at in the modern day for, um, for example, vision. And um, there are papers um, like, uh, and we actually did this in the TruePal project too, where uh, we actually looked at the, like what was happening in a node. We could like map it back to a visual activation. So we could see this node activates in the presence of a certain feature, like a fur or a tire or a car or something like this. <clears throat> and so you could study certain features of well-known domains. Uh, you could study learning procedures um, and try to generalize principles about different learning procedures. And you could also just try to model uh, very accurately model the human brain and then uh, draw some conclusions from that.
So as we mentioned, there's a gap between the subconceptual and conceptual level. There's also a gap in a relation between the neural and subconceptual levels. So we have basically three levels. Um, so we're asking, oh, one question we're asking is how does subconceptual activity map onto conceptual activity? Another question is how does neural activity map onto subconceptual activity? So going up through the levels, and this is not an easy question, and it needs to be accounted for. Um, and this is going. This is a contrasting with the usual view of connectionists who do already view their networks as literal neural models. Um, and this becomes even more and more. And this issue becomes even more and more obvious as connectionists offer techniques that um, give their networks mathematical optimization over neural plausibility. Um, so like backpropagation, I think there is a form of biological backpropagation, but it definitely does not work in, in the way that the current um, deep learning techniques work. So we can see how they're opting for mathematical optimization over neural plausibility. On the other hand, that doesn't mean we should just dismiss all the other connection systems just because they don't have a neural um, correspondence instead or for their neural unfaithfulness. Instead, we can take the opportunity to learn general principles about various sub-symbolic systems, and we can develop like a more complete theory of um, some symbolic systems and connectionism. <clears throat> so to summarize three levels, um, imagine three physical systems. You have a brain, this is the neural level, executing a cognitive process. You have a massively parallel connectionist computer running a sub-symbolic model of the brain. So this is the sub-symbolic level. And then you have a classical von Neumann computer running a symbolic model of that process. So this is on the symbolic level. And so if there's a cognitive process being executed, um, And so again, the, the sub-symbolic process can execute one of two processes. It can either subsecute a conscious rule application or it can, con it can execute the intuitive process. I'm very sorry that I'm, I'm reading this because this is a lot of information that I, I don't even remember everything. Um, so what they're saying is that if the connections network is carrying out a conscious rule application, um, so like on the higher, on, we can basically use the activity of the network and we can try to approximate like what the system is doing um, using the activity of the network, using language and concepts. Um, and you can consider this, for example, like if you're measuring brain activity, I, I know there are some experiments these days where they like read your mind using neural activity. They can say like, what do you, if you're thinking about certain words, you know, they can try to like decode that using deep learning techniques. Not exactly the same, but that, that's kind of what they're saying here. On the other hand, if the process is intuitive, so something like a motor program or like, um, like a sport or something, sport knowledge, um, there is no way we can even develop a high precision conceptual level description of this process um but we can try we can try to form a very basic approximation but it'll be very low precision compared to the conscious rule application and so in summary the sub symbolic uh, models are only accurately describing the microstructure of the cognition and the symbolic uh, models are are giving only an approximate description about the macro st structure of cognition so in the symbolic paradigm Conscious and unconscious rules are usually uh, explicitly defined at the conceptual level. And in the sub-symbolic paradigm, the conscious rules can be formalized at the conceptual level, but the intuition is formalized at the sub-symbolic level. And so what we're getting at is there are two systems. Again, there's two processors, a conscious rule interpreter and an intuition processor. And so if you think about two systems, you might think about a hybrid system. So why not take a symbolic system and a connection system and make them work together? But there are, of course, problems with that. Uh, how should the systems communicate? Uh, how did this, both systems learn? Um, especially reflecting the, the development of intuitive programs from conscious rule application and, and other issues. So instead, these problems really need to address by implementing both systems in a unified system. Um, and here, the author would say a subconceptual system. 
So the lower level intuitive processor needs to act as a virtual machine that it's going to do your intuitive processing, of course, but it's also going to implement the higher level conscious rule interpreter. And so the author says that once these subconceptual systems develop the ability to process natural language, so something I would guess he would be thinking something like chat GPT, then he would say they will be able to encode linguistic expressions as patterns of activity. <clears throat> and then these patterns of activity can be stored inside the network using the learning rules. And if these linguistic expressions themselves are rules, then the sub symbolic system can retrieve these rules and use them to solve problems sequentially. So basically, kind of what he's saying is basically like if chat GPT can learn logical rules by language, then it should be able, like given for language, and it should be able to use the language itself, the expression of the rule to actually use that problem, that rule to solve problems. So basically like train training chat GPT on linguist, linguistic, uh, on rules, I should say, logical rules. But for this to actually work, the sub-symbolic system needs to have the ability to take part of the reinstantiated pattern, encoding the verbal description of action and execute the action it describes. So it basically has to be able to take this rule and use it as an action. Then it, if it can do that, then it can apply these verbal, these verbal beliefs to actions and do something that results in conceptual or symbolic production system. All right, so what about consciousness? Consciousness reflects the large scale structure of activity patterns, the patterns which are stable for long periods of time and they extend over large regions of the network. The rule interpretation process requires that the rule being retrieved persists for a long period of time while we're applying it to the sequential problem. And this is the feeling of conscious effort, basically instantiating the rule in your mind for a um, longer period of time like relatively compared to say an implicit process or an intuitive process and you kind of keep it in your mind while you apply it to your sequential uh, reasoning problems. In contrast, once the rule has already been applied to a problem, you get the weights for solving the task and you store them in memory. And so after solving the task a couple of times, there's no need to keep recalling that, that rule pattern and stabilizing it in your memory. Instead, your intuitive processor has already done that, has the weights stored, and it can just solve the task directly without thinking about it, without any effort. And this process that he claims is the same for non-linguistic rules. So a musician could uh, listen to various songs and from them might develop an understanding of a musical rule, um, like what sounds right, what sounds wrong. And from there, they can consciously develop new songs later, which are still novel, but they'll still follow the general, general principles of music as they learn them. So again, note that the rule interpreter implemented by the sub symbolic system is only approximate. It has advantages and disadvantages compared to an exact symbolic implementation in a von Neumann machine. The primary disadvantage is that we don't know how to reliably develop a sub symbolic system that can actually even do this. Most connection systems, again, don't focus on implementing rule interpreters instead. Uh, and so because of that, the systems can't generalize into new domains because they can't use rules to generate new experiences. Theoretically, though, it at least should be possible. But for now, the symbolic systems lead the way in applying rule interpretation. Still, the primary advantage of the uh, of the connectionist approach is that the two processes are highly integrated. If we can understand how both the processes work and communicate with each other on the higher and low, lower levels, then we should be able to design an efficient, even hybrid symbolic and sub-symbolic system. Because then if we know how these two processes work, then we can actually design a more effective hybrid system as well. And it's also interesting that the rule selected by the system is selected intuitively in the in the connectionist, but in the neural network by the system itself. Um, so instead of having some sort of um, like condition by which it selects rules, um, the intuition of the network itself instantiates a rule um, just naturally. And so because of this, the rule selection is very context sensitive, depending on the current activity patterns and weights of the network. And when you think about two different kinds of systems, um, then you can kind of think there's two different kinds of knowledge contained in one knowledge medium. Um, so the knowledge applied in the weights or the knowledge that's in the weights can be applied with massive parallelism. So they call this P knowledge. 
Um, and if there's a conscious rule interpreter, if your connectionist system implements that, then you also will have a second form of knowledge called S knowledge. And that's all the rules that the system has memorized. Now the retrieval of rules is a parallel process. Um, and then the, because it's stored in the P knowledge, the, the rules themselves are instantiated by the, in the parallel process. And then once they are instantiated, the application of the rule is a serial process. And after a lot of uh, experience, the system will then can actually generate more P knowledge uh, while applying the rules under various uh, contexts. So what are the foundational issues? Uh, the current connection systems lack intentional psychology, an important property of a, connect of a cognitive system and that which differentiates them from other dynamical systems is that they can maintain the degree to which a number of goal conditions is met. So a river is a physical system, but it can only do one goal, it can only do one thing, it can flow downhill, can't, can't decide for anything else. But if you can compare this to a cockroach, it is a purely causal system. Compare this to a cockroach, which is also a physical system, but it's cognitive because it has many goals. It's because it has to do things like maintain its oxygen level, um, maintain its nutrition, its sex drive, it has to be avoid being killed by other animals. So here the author provides his definition for intelligence um, based on goals. The greater the repertoire of goals, and variety of tolerable environmental conditions, the greater the cognitive capacity of the system. And so a meta goal that underlies this is the prediction goal. So the system needs to, when it's given some partial information about the environment, it needs to correctly infer the correct missing information and use it. And then a related meta goal of the system is to improve that prediction process. So not only does it need to uh, make predictions from partial information but over time it needs to learn how to make even better predictions with increasing accuracy at least for a given environment and it's nice these sub symbolic systems are nice because they combine basically goals and beliefs they combine them into one unified system um so the system will acquire various internal states when various environmental conditions occur and is going to acquire true beliefs based on those which lead to meeting to the goal conditions. And so a major problem to be solved is the assignment blame problem um, because the network is a large combined causal system of many different states. So how are you going to determine which of these states resulted in failure of the goal condition? Uh, you can't even blame like a single node because it's, it's a superposition of many different states. Um, also, how can you guarantee that your processes of semantic co uh, content are truth preserved? And all of these problems are managed. How, how you manage these, these all depend on the learning procedure used in your neural network. Um, compare this to the classical AI systems. They automatically guarantee truth preserving throughout the whole system because they are built on proof theory. Uh, on the other hand, in sub-symbolic AI, logical inference is done via statistical inference. So if you explicitly formalize tasks like prediction as a statistical inference task, then you can prove that for the appropriate systems, the computation is comparable to a symbolic proof. And so he's just kind of trying to say here that statistical inference can work as logical. And so here he's going to demonstrate the different, a little, um, like a slight difference um, between the symbolic and the sub-symbolic interpretations. So let's say that we want to teach our system about the concept of coffee. Now we can't really, <clears throat> let's say that you can't really show coffee to the system directly, like the concept. There's no, it's really, it's sort of, it's just an item, it's abstract, but you have to do something more concrete to show the system. So like a cup of coffee or a cup without coffee. And if you can show the system cup of coffee and cup and just empty cup, it can subtract them and it will get coffee. So consider what happens in the symbolic paradigm. If you subtract these two statements, <laughs> subtract these two expressions, you're going to explicitly get coffee as a word. Meanwhile, in the sub-symbolic paradigm, you're going to get a distributed state representing a floating pool of liquid coffee with curved edges and it will have a flat bottom, flat top and a bottom surface, like basically literally coffee in the cup without the cup as, as it was visually perceived. 
Um, so it's a little bit more nuanced. It's a little bit more um, continuous and more context dependent. And that's that's fine there. Uh, and how about continuity? So within the symbolic paradigm, most formalizations use discrete character. So the benefit here is that you do get some discrete features that come for free in the system, uh, but it, it can also be downsides. So you do you get discrete memory locations without any interactions with each other, discrete memory storage and retrieval operations in which an entire item is stored or retrieved using an operation. You have a discrete learning operation in which new rules become available for use in the system in an all or nothing fashion. Uh, discrete inference operations, conclusions become available in an all or nothing fashion. Discrete categories, <clears throat> um, items either do or do not belong to certain categories dis um, explicitly. And discrete production rules um, with conditions that are either satisfied or not satisfied and actions that either do execute or do not execute. And so obviously this above list, because it's discrete, is only a crude categorization of cognition, since cognition appears to be an interwoven fabric of both graded continuous processes and discrete all or nothing processes. And so a number of practical issues will appear in the processing of continuous sensory and motor signals in, in a discrete system. And so one way this has been handled is by creating hybrid systems where you have your symbolic system, you have two processes, you have your symbolic system, you have your connective system, and then you combine them. The connection system will handle the continuous stuff, uh, maybe transform it into a discrete form, and then your symbolic system will process it. But we already discussed why hybrid systems are problematic. Alternatively, you could soften the discreteness of the symbolic approach, such as by giving conditions for production rules. Um, the conditions could be numerical values, um, assign, assigning various continuous strengths to different productions, allowing special manually decided rules that allow items which are separated in the memory to interact, um, and so on. Um, but the sub-symbolic paradigm offers us an opportunity to sweep all, aside all of these issues in one stroke and just adopt it a purely continuous framework. And then we can analyze the sub-symbolic system on the higher conceptual level. And then when we do that, we can find, um, we can find uh, the approximated aspects of discreteness emerging without us explicitly programming discreteness. Um, and this is kind of interesting. So here he gives <clears throat> that the goal of um sub symbolic system is the best fit principle. So given an input, the, the sub symbolic system should output a set of inferences that gives a best fit to the input in a statistical sense. Um, and basically to maximize some sort of fitness function here, he calls it a harmony function. Um, and so basically here he's just talking about um, how you need to maximize, you need to uh, like maximize uh, fitness or minimize error in your network predictions, uh, which we, we all know about this. Um, so in the course of computing an answer to a question, the units of the network are going to change a lot, hundreds of times, thousands of times. So each time a unit changes its value, it's gonna be called a micro decision. And as the network converges closer to a solution, we can start to identify macro decisions, which are basically commitments of part of the network to a portion of the solution. And we can view these macro decisions as approximations of symbolic production rules. And in fact, they fire in the same order as in a symbolic forward chaining inference system. For example, in a system that has learned to predict an answer to a question, what happens to the voltage value of a circuit if I increase the value of this resistor, if you can get a system that can predict this answer correctly, the system will be approximating a hard constraint, which is uh, the electronic physics laws of Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's law, and other circuit laws. Um, and if a connection system is purely linear, it can be proved that the higher level description obeys the same formal laws as the lower level. So the uh, computations on both levels are isomorphic. Um, but um, linear connection systems are really not very interesting. They're, they're very limited in their computational power. So most connection systems uh, use nonlinear activations. Um, but when you actually examine the nonlinear activations, uh, 
and and the functions being computed. Um, he calls these uh, fake linear or quasi linear, which means fake linear, um, because they actually are doing a linear sum of their inputs before they perform the activation function. So there is a linear computation being performed, and even though and the uh, the activation function is nonlinear, um, although it does uh, look linear. It'll, uh, if you, for example, a sigmoid or a tan H function. Um, so he calls these quasi linear. And so for this reason, um, although the higher level is not exactly isomorphic to the lower level in the quasi linear systems, the higher level will approximately obey formal laws that are similar to the lower level in such systems. Okay, moving on to schemata. So um, a schema, as we know, is a bundled piece of information that supports inferences in prototypical situations. So uh, like a schema in NARS would be like an implication statement. And um, so in a, in a given work on a connection to schemata, um, they ask some people to describe rooms using a set of given 40 features. So like has a window, has a toilet, things like that. Um, and then they made a network where each feature corresponds to a node. And then the connections were learned from the statistical data of the human responses. And what they found was that the network could perform inferences of a similar kind as a symbolic system. So if, for example, if they told the, the network that the room has a ceiling and an oven, the network would then go on to predict that the room also needs a coffee cup and should have a coffee pot, but it shouldn't have things like a computer or a toilet or a fireplace or anything like that. So the, the system was basically inferring from the given features related kitchen features. And this was done by greedily maximizing the fitness or the harmony. Um, and we can reduce the dimensional space down to, to like 2D or 3D. This was a 40 dimensional space because there were 40 features, but we can reduce it down to 2D or 3D for us to visualize. And we'll see that the highest harmony peaks correspond to um, rooms that uh, we know well, that like um, that include features like kitchens, bathrooms, and offices, um, because that's what I learned from the human responses. And so the, the system is behaving as though it has schemata for various rooms, even though they were never present on an explicit level. Instead, so the schemata are informally learned. They're approximate statistical descriptions of a subtle inference process. So in summary, macro inference is not a process of firing a symbolic production, but of a qualitative state change in a dynamical system. Schemata are not large symbolic data structures, but they are potentially intricate shapes of harmony maxima, fitness maxima. Categories are attractors in connectionist dynamical systems, states that suck into a commonplace many nearby states like peaks of harmony functions. Categorization is not the ex execution of a symbolic algorithm, but rather the continuous evolution of the dynamical system, the evolution that drives states into attractors that maximize harmony. Learning is not the construction and editing of formula, but the gradual adjustment of connection strengths with experience, with the effect of slowly shifting harmony landscapes, adapting old and creating new concepts, categories, and schemata. So here the author has not tried to argue for the validity of connectionism, to cognitive modeling, but rather has articulated a view of the role that con connectionist approaches play in cognitive science. So the question is, should the goal of connectionism be to replace other methodologies in cognitive science? But this seems to be a naive form of eliminative reductionism. Successful lower level theories do not generally serve to replace higher level theories, but to enrich them, to explain their successes and failures, to fill in where the higher level theories are inadequate and to unify disparate higher level accounts. The goal of sub-symbolic research should not be to replace symbolic cognitive science, but to explain the strengths and weaknesses of the existing symbolic theory, to explain how symbolic computation can emerge from non-symbolic computation, to enrich conceptual level research with new computational concepts and techniques to provide a uniform theory of cognition and so on. 